yeah, create new um, apps, whatever. Um, this is really uh, important because now in Berlin, what we are facing is we have a lot of illegal rentals, short-term rentals on the platform that we know about, but we cannot ban them because we have no uh, address, we have uh, no personal ID, whatever. So all you need is a local authority to um, enforce illegal rentals you have not. So that's why it's so necessary to get the data. Uh, the fourth uh, reason to hate Airbnb is definitely the tax flight because as um, Frank Pascal, a very uh, well-known researcher who did a very good uh, brochure about Airbnb and platform capitalism for the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, Frank Pascal said uh, the system of this uh, concern, this company, is to break the rules. And I think this is really easily said and this is really what it's about. Airbnb is breaking the rules. They are always getting, going a step far, far to look what's the reaction of the city, how far they can go, and they're really dictating their own rules. When we were uh, working on the new law, to uh, install in Berlin, they came to us saying, okay, we have a plan. This is uh, the perfect law. You could uh, easily just copy and then uh, just decide it like that because this would be so cozy for all the home sharers and all the Airbnb users. And I was like, how come? I mean, how come that <laughs> Airbnb is going to local authorities, to members of parliament saying, we know what's best for you. So, but the truth is that works. It works. Members of parliament <laughs> listen to them, to these lobbyists, and saying, yes, it sounds like I can understand what you're telling me, so maybe this is the best way. And as well, a lot of them are afraid as well, because fighting against Airbnb is no fun. Of course not, because they have the best lawyers, they have a lot of capital, and if you really want to struggle with them, it's, of course it takes time, it takes money, and you really need um, the will to do this. So tax flight is a big thing, because people who are renting via Airbnb usually don't pay like the city tax, or they don't, um, are, they are not registered with the local um, uh, economy, so they just doing it just one time, so it's fine. But it's not, of course, because if uh, one million people are uh, renting their houses just one time, illegally, without paying taxes, you can easily think about the money that um, is, uh, um, yeah, uh, lose, lost from the uh, local authorities. So, fifth reason to hate Air Airbnb is over-tourism and gentrification of local economy and small handicraft business. Um, we speaking about over-tourism in Amsterdam, Barcelona, and uh, as well, Lisbon as well, yes. Um, there are many cities that have much, much more to struggle with uh, over-tourism than Berlin, this is true. But um, what we now see, there's like a, a map where you can see the most indicated streets with the most um, rental um, uh, spots. And uh, there you can easily see um, how this system works. Because if you have in, a, in one street only tourists, then you can uh, understand that the local economy, which was before like a handicraft man, uh, can lose uh, the place to produce and then another uh, touristic shop will come. So uh, I was talking about this. Airbnb is systematically breaking rules. This is really important to understand and that's why it's, it's so good that we have Kenneth and <laughs> the European Observatory um, that showed us with the report on Airbnb uh, how this uh, breaking the rules, how this works and how they lobby uh, the different levels of politics and how they work uh, in breaking the rules. So let me come to an end. Uh, I was thinking about, uh, I mean, 
Airbnb is no fun. Airbnb is something like a Darth Raider. It's like the <laughs> the <laughs> the highest um, and the highest enemy you can get. I mean, they are really. It's really hard to fight uh, with them. So I found on the internet uh, this uh, picture with our um, states minister on digitalization. Mm. Um, she is always going to uh, ferries about uh, gaming and something like that. She finds it, I think, very uh, funny. Um, but of course, uh, this is like uh, the conservatives are doing nothing for uh, digital control, uh, digital agenda, and digital sovereignty, what we should, what we definitely need. So I think we really have to talk about laws uh, on the local level uh, with whom we can um, yeah, fight against illegal uh, action of Airbnb. And as well, we need campaigns because many people are really afraid if they see campaigns showing okay it's not okay if you rent your house always to uh, on airbnb um the the rents are increasing and all the the crisis the housing crisis will go on so but as well we need really to talk about what can we do as uh, the the uh, local authorities what could we do with all the data i mean imagine if we had the data and not like Uber, Airbnb, we could really serve the people in our city um, a lot of good things. We would know when the buses go, which streets, um, all those things now the big platform companies are knowing because they have the data. So we, re we really need an idea about a left digitalization strategy and how to bring uh, public goods in digital, um, uh, in the digital age back to the people. For this, I have a, a very good <laughs> publication uh, I want uh, you to know about. It's uh, the, um, uh, about the smart city. It's uh, Francesca Bria and Yevgeny Morozov, which are well known for their work on um, the questions in digital cities. And they are talking a lot about uh, what cities can do, like count with counter strategies and so on. Last but not least, I would say um, what we see in Barcelona as well, they have a transparency register where it is shown uh, where are like legal spots to rent. Because they said, okay, if Airbnb does not give us the data about the illegal ones, we just make a register about the legal ones. So you now have a register that is called legally um, traveling uh, in Barcelona. So there you can see where it's legal uh, to live and to, uh, um, to stay. And another one I am very, um, yeah, I would really concentrate on is that the control of the registrations should definitely be done by the Senator of Finance because now we have uh, the situation that the uh, same authority that c looks for uh, cars parking in the wrong, uh, wrong places, those people have to look for illegal rental uh, houses. So this is absolutely not going on. I mean, it is not working that we are facing a digital platform a company that is like worldwide organized, having the best software in the world. Um, and we as a city have three people walking the streets, looking for houses, having uh, like uh, curtains and chairs that looks like a, a, um, a house a accommodation for tourists. No way. So we really <laughs> need new strategies and other uh, forms of control. So this is mainly all of uh, what I wanted to say. Of course, we need a digital tax on the European level, which is also really a big fault of the social democrats. I cannot understand. But yeah, the uh, digital tax, of course, I mean, they are giants. They, they are capitalistic giants. And we really have to tax them, first of all. Then we have to uh, control their illegal uh, things. Okay. So yeah, thank you and uh, let's talk about digital infrastructures and data infrastructures 
as public goods and public infrastructures. Hi, now this is my turn, I guess. So, can you hear me? Yes. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Stefania Nimento. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Catalin, for inviting me and the Transform uh, Group. Um, I am a researcher at the University of Lüneburg in Germany, uh, though I come from Italy. So I'm particularly happy to be here. And uh, today, well, um, today I'm going to talk. I have the, the big challenge of talking about possible alternatives to Airbnb or at least some positive uh, perspectives to, uh, on, on to the future uh, on this um, field um, of life uh, um, and in uh, urban life in particular. And. Um, and yes, well, what I'm going to do, uh, maybe I'm going to talk very briefly about the research project I'm, I'm working on, and then maybe trying to give a couple of uh, hopes uh, <laughs> in front of Airbnb, although I know it is, it, is, it is not that easy. And also, we have heard a lot about Airbnb, so I won't repeat too much um, how Airbnb is bad, because I guess we all have get it <laughs> very much, very well. So um, I'm working at the research project since January. Uh, the funny thing is that it is actually financed by the European Commission, which is <laughs> shows maybe how sometimes the, the, the Commission itself is not so homogeneous, but still, um, yeah, uh, the <laughs> the heterogeneous. And uh, the research project's name is PLUS, Platform Labour in Urban, Urban Spaces. So um, it's a big project and it's um, uh, led by, by more or less 15 partners, among which some universities and also cooperatives, digital cooperatives and platforms um, of the solidarity economy, so, to, uh, so called. And uh, we are basically uh, researching seven European cities, among which also Lisbon and Barcelona, Berlin, which is the, the city I'm studying, um, Paris, London, Tallinn and Bologna in Italy. And, um, and what we're doing is, trying, uh, is focusing on four platforms, uh, also Airbnb, but also Uber, um, Helpling and Deliveroo. So we are trying to look a bit at uh, the broader picture of platform capitalism and platform labor in particular. So our focus is actually on, on work and labor and how um, digital capitalism and platforms are affecting labor, social protection of, of workers, uh, uh, labor rights, uh, working conditions, and so on. So uh, in that sense, um, it is a bit, uh, a slightly different focus from what we are talking today, but we still have Airbnb in the sample, um, also because there is a lot of work also surrounding Airbnb, because uh, the more it professionalizes, the more it gets a professional service, as we have seen, um, the more people are also involved into um, uh, cleaning, for instance, the flats, or managing the, the flats, um, bringing the, the keys and so on. So we have in Berlin, for instance, people working for the Helpling platform, which is a platform for cleaning services, and they clean flats which are then rented on Airbnb. So th there is a kind of uh, infrastructure of platforms which is actually emerging. Um, so um, this is more or less the project. So we have just started, so we, we um, are still doing uh, much research. Um, what I'm trying to, uh, uh, to focus on today is on one, two, two things, two, two points or two perspectives on, on Airbnb, on one side, um, uh, one partner of the PLUS project, which is a, a cooperative called uh, FairBnB. So we had the, the report Unfairbnb, Airbnb, and then FairBnB, <laughs> so as a, the three um, alternatives. Um, and then uh, on an, um, a more complex uh, thing, uh, which is how the uh, holiday flats are uh, managed in Cuba. So. Uh, put in a geographic focus uh, away, away from Europe. But let, let me talk a bit about uh, Fairbnb now, so it is partner of the project, so I, I'm not uh, involved in the project itself, uh, but I, I was speaking also with Damiano, who is one of the founders, um, also to have some um, current updates on the project. I don't know if you have heard about it, but basically it is a platform, um, also a platform, but um, um, organized as a co cooperative, and it was founded in 2016. I think they even have their seat in Brussels, if, I don't, if I'm not wrong. And um, basically the idea is that of 
coping, uh, like doing the same as Air, what, what Airbnb is doing, more or less, uh, but in a fair, fair way. Or at, at least I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain you a bit the, the, the main criteria. Um, so one thing, well, of course, the one, one main difference is that of being a cooperative. So they're not working with, um, they're not taking uh, capital from uh, venture capital or business angels or whatever other actors are going to finan are financing usually startups, uh, but rather they take money more from uh, cooperatives and, and ethical banks uh, and this kind of um, institutional actors. Then they also have the, um, basically the thing, well, quite, a couple of important criteria. Uh, one, 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 one of these is the fact that one host has one house, so there cannot be hosts which uh, offer more flats or more rooms, uh, so that they can avoid having professional hosts, um, which is different from, from what happens in Airbnb. The other thing is that 50% of the commission fee uh, taken by every, from every host um, offering its, its room or, or flat is, is given actually to um, local projects, so projects in the same, very same city where the, the flat is, is rented, and this project should be decided um, accord, uh, along participation processes with residents and with local partners uh, like associations, NGOs. So basically the idea is that of having um, local nodes with like networks of, of actors uh, which act on, on the ground, like social uh, associations and um, initiatives, uh, I, I guess they are trying to do it the more grassroots uh, as possible. Um, and then having, having the support in order to find people willing to offer their rooms, not on Airbnb, but on Fairbnb, and thereby provide, uh, collecting also some money to be reinvested in the local communities, basically. So either for uh, social cohesion or uh, uh, against gentrification. It's, the very fact is that actually it, it, is still have, um, it still has to be released. So I think the next, uh, next week it's going to have its first release in five or six cities, and then in September they are going to open the platform like more widely and the goal is to reach I think 120 cities. So what I, what I listened, uh, listened uh, interviewing Damiano, um, one of the, the guys of Airbnb, is that what they would like to have is scaling up so that to be able to compete with Airbnb. Of course we are talking about a huge giant so I, I, I don't, I'm not going to to give uh, an evaluation on this also because it's everything in its very early stage. But I think it is in interesting to think of, um, like it's an interesting project to think of how we can deal with tourism, also connect uh, the, the housing question and, and tourism and, and how tourism, tourism is changing in, in cities um, and manage them somehow or at least um, face them because they are not going to, to disappear. I don't think that people will stop uh, looking for private uh, homes uh, where they can spend their holidays. Uh, at least not tomorrow. <laughs> so this is something that I, one, one first part that I wanted to uh, put to the discussion. Um, as I said, it is still very much in progress, so I, I have some more information. Maybe we can talk, if you have questions, uh, we can talk about this in this discussion. And the second uh, kind of um, perspective that I want also to give, um, as I said, is it comes from Cuba, so quite far away. Actually, there are not so many, well, I'm a researcher, but there, are, there is not so much uh, scientific literature, actually, uh, about Cuba. I, I was also looking for, for this, but I guess it has also political reasons. Um, but basically, what, I'm, what I can uh, tell comes out from a holiday research trip. I did so ethnographic work, maybe we can say, so being a tourist myself, but also doing some research on how it is managed there. And what is interesting, well, is that, I mean, on one side we see platform cooperatives like Airbnb trying to do something better within capitalism. What is interesting about Cuba is that you have a system which is different from the, from the very ground, so um, uh, which is somehow um, yeah, organized around so socialism. Um, so, of course, there you have a, a starting point which is to totally different because since the revolution in 59, they had one of the th first measures that they took, that the revolutionary, uh, revolutionary um, uh, party took, was that of um, stopping evictions and guaranteeing um, House, the right to housing as a basic right, and this is something which is not only on, on the law, on the on paper, so to speak, but it was really done. So all the people who were living in their homes were um, basically got their homes uh, in lease um, until um, until the 80s, I guess, and after the 80s they were given that to them, so they, they became landlords, so to speak, or homeowners. Um, 
Then um, what, what, what is definitely important to know when talking about a case, before I, I tell you more about the, the, the system of, of uh, holiday flats, um, is that there was also, a, well, basically until 2000 um, and 2011 in particular, it was almost impossible to, send, to sell housing in Cuba. So the, it was only possible to do swaps um, between houses of the same price or the same market price. So of course we had a market which wasn't a market as we Westerners uh, know it. Um, and, um, but then, in but then, then there were some, some waves of liberalizations you might, you might know also about this, so I won't, I won't go much uh, in detail. Um, uh, in 2011, uh, there was a, a, a new law um, about housing, and since then, then it is easier to um, treat housing as a commodity, even though it is still almost impossible to buy housing in Cuba, for instance, if you're not Cuban yourself. So there are, for instance, some Cubans giving their names to foreigners in, or in order to let them buy housings, housing, but it's not very common. Um, why did I tell you all of this? Uh, basically because the system that, um, well, let's say, uh, tourism is one of the major uh, parts, sectors of the economy of Cuba, you know, it, because of embargo there wasn't much more to be done and after the, the fall of the Soviet Union, um, there was a, a, a so-called special period in which there was a huge crisis in Cuba and one of the ways that Castro um, applied in order to, end, to escape the crisis was that of investing very much on tourism, uh, on infrastructures and, and, and so on. And what is interesting is that in 1997 um, there was, it was given the possibility to people to rent their homes um, in a formal way, like uh, by, by getting a license from the state. Um, these homes are called casas particulares, so I guess if you go to Cuba, the, the, the main way to, to sleep uh, is, is actually going into the, the homes of people, um, and then you get one room or two rooms or, or whatever, and, and um, let's say like they have to pay one tax every month, um, it's the same even, uh, no matter if they rent it or not, so it's uh, a fixed um, amount of money they have to pay to the state to do this. Um, and basically with the money which is collected um, from that, uh, in some cases it is directly utilized to um, reinvest in the local place. So somehow a bit what Airbnb does but it on a big scale and in a much more formal way. So for instance the center of Havana Vieja or Baviana, Havana or the capital of Havana Vieja, it's, a, it's um, uh, completely almost, com it's very much renewed. It was the, in a great decay in the 90s and now it like, looks like a museum somehow. And it was basically, I think, for, the, for 50 percent renewed with the money coming from the Casas Particulares. Of course, this is not to say that, that it's super great and there are no problems in, in this because I think um, there are, even though they are trying to avoid gentrification and displacement, of course the, 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 the cities are changing and also this very neighborhood I was talking about, about is changing a lot and when you get a place which looks like a museum, it might be not very easy to stay in that place. Um, it is, uh, also, there are other problems of social inequality brought by this, um, by this system because, of course, uh, the people there who live on tourism are very much richer than the other ones. Um, nonetheless, I think it's interesting to think of how um, it can be different um, on a, diff on a different uh, political and economic system, of course, but still, um, I think it's important for us also to try to develop alternatives and not all, I mean, it's super best, in fundamental to criticize Airbnb and, and to develop laws against it, but also we, we should think, I think, um, impossible alternatives and how to, um, how to develop positive, cons uh, constructive uh, things. Um, so basically, in the end of this, uh, I would say that the two examples that I brought um, maybe show that there are some key points which have been actually already mentioned, so I just uh, will briefly tell them on, on one hand. On the one hand, there is the question about who has the say about um, this kind of process of, of um, short-term rental. So it is the residents, it is the uh, lobbyists, uh, it is uh, the state, or, or who then? Um, the second thing is, is about who profits from it, because uh, we could see it also as a and economic sectors as many others, and the question then is about who takes the gain um, about, uh, from this. And then the last fact is of course that ownership. Well, in the case of Cuba, that's the state. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's very different from here, um, but it's definitely uh, a question that we have to, I think also I agree with Katarina, that's one of the main questions we have to take in, into mind. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So, I think, um, thank you very much, all the speakers, and um, 
we can open up for uh, questions. Anyone? <laughs> there are microphones here. Hi. Um, Stuart Wise from uh, London, Ontario, Canada. Um, some cities have like a tourist tax and and um, uh, Airbnb doesn't necessarily collect those taxes. Uh, uh, 